it's day five of Advent of Code, and as you may know, these challenges tend to increase in difficulty as the days go on. I think today is the first day where we're going to really start to feel that. Today's challenge is about stacks of crates that we want to move around one at a time using a crane. And you'll notice that unlike the previous puzzles, our input isn't just like a list of all the same things. It comes in a few different forms here, so that might actually be a challenge, but we'll find out soon enough. Let's go ahead and get started. As usual, we'll start by pasting in our sample input. And normally we would go right into parsing this out because normally it's really just a matter of breaking it up line by line. But I think we're gonna have to actually put some care into how we represent this in order to make it easier to work with. I think it'll be a lot easier to do what we need to with these if the stacks are listed horizontally instead of vertically. So I wanna flip these. In fact, I wanna represent the stacks as an array of strings where each string represents the crates on the stack from top to bottom. We could use an array of arrays instead, but I think using strings is gonna be pretty minimal and nice. One thing to note is that since we're using an array, the indices are going to start at zero, whereas the labeling of the stacks starts at one, so we'll have to keep that in mind when we're actually following these instructions. So I think there are going to be three main challenges here. First of all, representing the stacks in the form of an array of strings like we want, that's probably going to take quite a bit of time and quite a bit of code in and of itself. The next thing is that we want to write a function for actually moving crates from one stack to another. That's really the core of what we're trying to do in this problem, but I don't know if it's going to actually be the toughest part here. And then the last thing is to go through the list of instructions and actually move the crates. Before we do anything else, I just want to quickly split up the input into the stack part and the instructions part by doing a dot split on the double new line character. And now we're going to focus on the stack part in order to get it converted into an array of strings. Something to notice is that the input has quite a bit of extra characters that we're not really going to use. The only part we really need to pay attention to are the actual characters for each crate. We don't actually even really need the list of indices at the bottom because we'll be able to tell just based on where the character is in the string. So I'm going to start by breaking this part up into rows and then using dot slice to remove the last row since we won't be using it. Now if we look at the indices of the characters that we're actually interested in, we've got 1, 5, 9, all of these are numbers that would give us a remainder of 1 if we were to divide them by 4. So I'm going to convert this into a matrix of the important characters by using a dot map that converts each row into an array, and then we'll use dot filter on each of those arrays to give us just the characters that have an index that have a remainder of one when divided by four. And since we're not actually using the character itself in the filter callback, I'm just using this underscore as a placeholder because the index is always the second argument. And now we basically want to take the transpose of this. It can be kind of complicated to do this in a functional way. I'm going to use reduce for it, but before we do, let's just go through how we would do it with a loop just so we understand what the process is. So we'll start by figuring out how many stacks we're dealing with so that we can make an array that basically consists of that many empty strings. And then we're going to go through the matrix to actually fill these up. Basically for each character, we're just going to say, is this an empty character? And if not, we'll add it onto the corresponding string, which will be the one at the column index of stack matrix. Great, that seems to be giving us what we're looking for. If we compare it to the sample input, we have a stack with N on the top and then Z below that. The next one has D on the top, then C, then M, and the last one is just P. We're ignoring all the blank spaces. This definitely looks like what we're looking for. But we want to do it in a functional way because all these mutating variables are kind of making me uncomfortable. Okay, so because in this situation we were using a double nested for loop, we're going to replace it with a double nested reduce. I think this is the first time we're doing one of those, so this will be exciting. It's something new. All right, so we're going to use a reduce on our matrix. And our accumulator is going to be an array that starts out the same way as what we had before. It's just going to be an array of all the stacks starting out as empty strings. And then for each row of the matrix, we're going to do a reduce on that too, where the accumulator is this inner array 
that starts out with an initial value of whatever the outer array is so that we're resuming with the same result on each iteration, similar to the way our for loops worked. So then this inner reducer is gonna to check to see if the current character is a space. And if it is, it'll just return the same array. We don't have to modify it at all because we don't wanna add anything to it. And if it isn't just a space character, then we're gonna add on to one of the strings in our array. So we're just gonna use a dot map that basically says, hey, are you the string with this column index? If so, take this character, otherwise stay the same. And then that's it. So this works just like the double nested for loop that we had before. It might not be as easily readable, but it's definitely functional, so <laughs> at least there's that. And I use these inner array and array accumulator variable names just to show that they actually are different accumulators, but you could use the same name if you wanted to. I don't know if that makes it more or less clear, but we might as well leave it like this for now, because really that one accumulator is only being modified within the inner reduce. Either way, we have our stacks in the form we want them. I think in some ways this is going to be the toughest part of the challenge, so let's go ahead and move on from here. So we'll start by writing a function that moves one crate from one stack to another. Basically the way it's going to work is that we're going to give it the stacks array and it'll give us a modified version of the stacks array after the move has happened. So if you remember from the sample input, our instructions are using one based indices for the stacks. So the item we actually want to move has an index of from minus one in our stacks array. And it's going to be the top element on the stack. So it's going to have index zero within the string. And then we'll return that modified version of the array by doing a dot map. And it's going to be pretty simple what the dot map does. It basically just says, well, is this the index of the one that we're moving this thing from? In which case, it will take off the first element by using dot slice with an index of one. Otherwise, we'll ask if it's the index that we're moving the item to, in which case we'll just concatenate it to the beginning of the string. And if it's neither of those, we'll just keep that string the same. So now we can test this out using the first instruction from the list in our sample input. It's asking us to move one crate from stack two to stack one. And there we go. So D was the name of the crate that was on the top of stack two. Now it's on the top of stack one and it's no longer on stack two. So all of that is working the way we want. Now let's think about how we'd execute the next instruction. So now we need to move three crates from stack one to stack three. Since our function only moves one crate at a time, I'm just gonna nest the function three times for now. And this is gonna look pretty awkward, but it is doing what we want. So basically it's moving crate D first, then crate N, then crate Z. So we could keep it this way and just execute the function as many times as we need to for each instruction, but there's probably a simpler way. We're basically just taking the first three characters of stack one and then reversing those and concatenating them to stack three at the start. So we could modify our function to do all of that in one so that we don't have to call it a bunch of times. So we're using dot slice here, both to get the elements that we're gonna be taking from the from stack and concatenating them to the to stack, as well as to actually remove them from the from stack. Okay, so this is almost what we want, but you'll notice we're not actually reversing the part that we're moving here. There actually isn't a reverse method for strings, but we can use the reverse method for an array to write a function to reverse a string. So we'll take a string input, convert it to an array, use the dot reverse method, and then join it back to a string and return that. And if we didn't want to use a multi-line arrow function expression, we could just copy this moved crates code down here because we're really only using this variable once anyway. And it looks like that's still working, so let's go ahead and move on. I'll just clean up the code a bit, and now basically the next thing is that we actually want to go through our list of instructions and start executing them using this move crates function. So the way this is basically going to work is that we're going to take our initial stacks array, and then for each instruction, we're going to create a new array by using this move crates function. But before we do any of that, we want to make our instructions nice and understandable to the code. So I want to convert them from a full string to basically just the three numbers we're looking for, the amount, the from stack, and the to stack. So our function for converting these instructions into the relevant numbers 
is going to be very similar to the strategy we used on day four. We're going to use a regular expression with the dot match string method, and then we'll use destructuring to get the three numbers we're looking for, and we're also using dot slice to get rid of the first element in the match, which is basically the full string itself, and then we want to convert these to numbers using our dot map like we've seen before. So now we can see that this function is working. It's converting our instruction into just the amount, the from index, and the to index. So if we do this to all of our instructions, we should be able to easily start executing them using the move crates function. So if you remember at the start, we broke down our input into the stack part and the instructions part. So let's grab that. We'll do a dot split on the new line character to break this up into an array of instructions. And then we'll do a dot map on that to convert them into the relevant numbers we're looking for. I'm sure it's very tempting to want to use a loop for this, but I think we can handle using a reduce. So we'll do instructions.reduce, and then our accumulator is just going to be the array of stacks. So it's going to start out as our initial stacks that we calculated earlier. And then on each step, the next accumulator will be assigned whatever value we get by doing our move crates function. And nice, there we go. So we're getting the expected value based on the problem description. So this is looking pretty good. Now it's probably worth mentioning that if we didn't want to write out all of these variables, we could actually use the spread operator to just give all the instruction values at once. But I kind of think it's nicer for readability to have them all listed out here. So I'm just going to keep it like this for now. Okay, so we're almost done here. But if you recall in the puzzle description, they said they just wanted the top crate from each stack and we want to put those together into a single string. So let's go ahead and do that. And then we can submit it with our puzzle input. We'll just do a quick dot map to get the zeroth element from each of these strings because that's where the top crate is going to be, which is convenient. So these are the right characters, but we want to put them together as one string. So we'll just use a dot join with an empty string. And that is exactly what we're looking for. So I think our code's looking pretty nice. Let's go ahead and submit it with the puzzle input. All right, so I've pasted our code into the browser console along with our asynchronous summon puzzle input function. And something super important to mention here is I got in a lot of trouble here by using dot trim. The reason I was using dot trim before was to get rid of the new line character that comes at the end of our puzzle input when we summon it this way. But it didn't occur to me that it also removes white space from the beginning of the puzzle input. And based on the way we get those stacks in this problem, that actually really can mess it up as it turns out. So I'm now using dot slice with negative one as the end index to remove that extra new line. Okay, let's go ahead and run this and we'll see if this string is the right answer. Oh yeah, that's what we love to see. Okay, great stuff. Now, if we take a look at part two, it's not that much more complicated. They're basically now saying that instead of moving one crate at a time, we're gonna move multiple crates at a time. So this might just be based on the way we wrote our code, but I think this one's actually gonna be easier. So basically everything's going to be the same. We're going to reuse almost all the code from part one. The only difference is now when we move the crates, we're not going to reverse the substring that we move from one stack to another. So the code actually becomes a little bit simpler. We're just going to copy the relevant parts here, but there's probably a way we could do this to be a little more dry. Maybe we could submit another variable as part of our move crates function to specify whether we want to reverse it or not, but I think it's okay like this for now. It's up to you. Okay, so for the results for the second part, I'm not being super creative about my variable names. I'm just going to call them final stacks two and stack tops two, and we're going to use the multi move crates function for this. And there we go, we're getting a different result from before. I believe it's the one from the puzzle description. Let's go ahead and just submit this with the puzzle input. All right, so I'm back in the browser console again. I'll paste the code. And just a reminder, once again, you can get the puzzle input however you want. I just like doing it from the browser console. All right, so we're getting a response here. Hopefully it's the right one. Let's go ahead and try to submit that. Nice. Okay, congratulations, we've got our stars for the day. This was a really cool problem. 
I like that it kind of broke the pattern of having a puzzle input that was just like a list of all the same type of things. So this one was really cool. I do kind of feel like just parsing out the input was really the tough part of this, but it was a fun one. I definitely enjoyed this. Hopefully you did too. As for the bonus challenge, I noticed that this puzzle reminded me of the Towers of Hanoi. So I was thinking we could try something more like that. Let's try to find the minimum number of moves it would take to rearrange each tower into alphabetical order. And we can try that for both parts. For an additional challenge, we could try to find the minimum number of moves it would take to get all the crates arranged alphabetically on a single tower, but I think that's getting into the territory of extreme difficulty, so that's going to be it for today. Thanks for watching, and remember, the first step is believing you can do it. Bye!